So hi everyone, thanks for joining. Welcome to the 14th Embedded Working Group meeting. Um, we are Maria Merlan and Pablo Garrido, we work in product management uh, in Microgross. I'm gonna share now in the chat the document but I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, here this document will be chat. So uh, we ask you to add your names to the attendee list on the top of the meeting notes. And um, today we have several invited speakers. We have Juan Manuel Jimeno that we uh, have, he has prepared a PowerPoint presentation about his work in uh, ROS2 robot with MicroRos. And then to introduce the new experimental middleware for microverse, Alexander Kapman and Pablo Garrido will make a brief overview of embedded RTPS implementation and RMW embedded RTPS for microverse. Um, finally, if you wish to treat any further topic, please add them into the miscellaneous section of this document and they will be discussed at the end. Um, I want to thank the speakers in advance and I want to encourage the attendees to raise questions, please, at the end of the, um, of the presentations. So we have a pretty tight agenda today and we can start. Juan Manuel Jimeno, uh, are you ready? Can you share your screen? Hello? Yeah, can you see, can you all screen my, see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, sound check. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Juan. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, Liner Robot 2. But uh, first of all, I want to thank the Mike Ross team for inviting me here and for helping me to uh, finish the project, especially uh, uh, when I was encountering some of the issues in the repository. So uh, just a brief outline. So I'll be talking about the introduction about the project, um, about the supported hardware, uh, the robot architecture, um, talk more about the MicroRos uh, firmware, uh, the gazebo simulation pipeline for the robot, and uh, some demos for autonomous navigation. Right. So, uh, what is Lino Robot? So, Lino Robot is uh, basically a suite of open source uh, compatible robots that is aimed to provide uh, students, developers, a accessible uh, mobile platform um, that can be built using easy, easily accessible parts. Right, so uh, the ROS1 version started back in 2016, and there was a failed attempt to port ROS2 in 2018. Right, the reason being that, um, so I wanted to keep the bots to be running at the same uh, bots as ROS1, which is Tinsy bots, and um, I didn't have uh, really a success to uh, get these bots running on the Tinsy. So fast forward to 2021, so we now have micro uh, ROS, which uh, supports um, running on Arduinos that are 32 bits, right? And uh, so the project supports uh, barrier, various uh, mobile platforms such as two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, um, and mechanical drive. And there's a uh, Ackerman steering to, that is uh, ongoing. So within the package itself, it, uh, you can use it for autonomous navigation and uh, as well as uh, doing your slam to create the map. And on top of that, you can as well uh, simulate your robots um, using Gazebo. And uh, we do have a small community. Um, you can join us. Feel free to join us at uh, uh, this link. So on the right side, uh, these are the two uh, robots that I have built. So these are basically DIY. 
um, that has been used to prototype uh, the ROS2 version of the project. So here's Hex and with my dog and uh, Bebo, which is uh, an off-the-shelf robot from, that I bought from China. So previously, these are some of the cool stuff that uh, the community has built uh, using the ROS1 version. So uh, the first one is Relay. Um, so the idea here is to create a healthcare robot, an assistive healthcare robot to um, help um, elderly. So uh, as you can see here, they've started with a very small prototype and then eventually uh, scaled the robot up into uh, something that will be able to help uh, a senior citizen. And a few more uh, DIY builds that's been used in the universities is a uh, Pluto bot, and another one from a uh, robotics club here in Singapore. So they they built this uh, robot that is able to navigate using um, brushless motors and electronic speed controllers. And uh, last project is this uh, autonomous wheelchair that I use for work using the same stack. So I've converted a electric uh, wheelchair into fully autonomous. It's able to navigate by itself. So for Lino Robot 2, um, here are some of the capabilities and the supported hardware. So aside, um, it's uh, fully NAV2 cap compatible. You can as well use the Slum Slam toolbox to create your maps. There's a parameterized description files uh, just to make it easier for users to uh, create the URDF files and to start with their simulation. So once you have defined um, the transforms and um, the shape of the robot can straight away simulate using Gazebo. And here, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, here are the supported uh, base at the moment. And there are also um, fully supported sensors, um, such as RP LiDAR, LD LiDAR. So these are mostly um, very cheap sensors that can use, and as well as uh, very familiar uh, depth sensors, as, such as RealSense and Z cameras. So why supported is that because there are, there are these environment, var environmental variables that you can use to uh, easily switch which kind of sensors that you want to use for your robot. And so for the hardware-wise, there are um, very accessible IMUs that are available in the market that you can use for the project and as well as for the motor drivers um, like L298 and uh, basically those motor drivers that have two direction pin or one direction pin. Um, for bigger builds, you can use a BTS 7960, which is pretty buff uh, motor driver for bigger robots. In terms of supported microcontrollers, right now it only, it's only supports uh, from TNC 3.0 to 4.1. And for tested dev boards, um, there's uh, this Jetson Nano for uh, gigabytes and Raspberry Pi, uh, which I tested on 8 gigabyte version. And on top of that, uh, it also provides a schematic uh, diagrams for users to um, rebuild the robot uh, at home. Right. So here's the architecture of the project itself. So there are three main components um, of the stack, mainly the hardware and the sensors itself, and the robot microcontroller where uh, MicroRAS Arduino library runs, and as well as uh, the robotics libraries that's used to make the robot run. And on top of that is uh, the robot computer, which, which runs all the ROS packages and allows you to uh, run NAV2, right? So the beauty of this is that um, although all these data, uh, which is the odometry data and sensor data, is directly published from the microcontroller itself, right? As compared to uh, the previous version, uh, if, you, if you look closely, it's almost pretty similar. It's just that uh, the main difference here is that uh, previously I had to create all these um, relay uh, nodes as uh, the one that's running on the raw serial are very lightweight messages. So the idea is that um, with these light messages, it sends to the robot computer and it, it reconstructs the message into a full-fledged um, ROS messages. So that the reason behind this is that um, I think the um, odometry messages and the sensor messages was too big for the Arduino, uh, for the raw serial client to handle, right? So hence the uh, these relay nodes to be running on the robot computer. So in terms of the firmware and uh, porting the uh, into ROS2, so uh, it's mainly based on the uh, examples that you can find from the micro ROS Arduino. So it's, it's, it's very well commented and um, there's a very comprehensive suite of uh, examples such as the publishers, um, reconnection examples, 
um, time synchronization and as well as subscribing to these messages, which is very ideal if you want to build a robot. Right. And uh, another tool that uh, that I used here is I'm not using the Arduino IDE, but I, rather I'm using a platform uh, IO, which allows you to uh, develop the firmware without having the Arduino IDE uh, running. And as well as it allows you to have uh, over the air uh, firmware loading and updating of the firmware, uh, this comes in handy if, for example, you have uh, your microcontroller somewhere inaccessible, right? So you don't have to connect to your monitor and just connect it to your dev board and you'll be able to run and update your firmware, right? as well as um, package management and it also supports um, a wide variety of Arduino compatible boards. So here, so I'm sharing here as, uh, the configuration package just in order for MicroOS to be able to run on platform IO. So basically, um, just have to tell where's the live dependency. So what happens is platform IO would automatically download this for users if it doesn't find it in your PC. And um, you just have to link the library, the exact library for uh, the board that you're using. In this case, it's the IMX uh, 1062, which is for 10C40, and uh, just link to live micro ROS. So some of you changes on, on these examples is the time synchronization, right? So I was having a lot of problems when I was building this, especially when I was using common filter, uh, the robot localization packages, as initially um, the time from the mic controller wasn't synchronized with ROS time. So uh, this was simply, um, um, this, was sent, uh, this was simply solved by uh, calculating the time offsets by using the ROS uh, things um, by basically calling the micro ROS epoch millis, right, and calculating the time offsets, and so that when you issue your time, you, you can add this offset to the microcontroller time, and and then from then you can synchronize the ROS clock to the microcontroller clock, right. And once you have this offset time, you can uh, use this uh, when you publish your census, and so when when any nodes uh, on ROS two receives this data, um, when when it matches this time to ROS clock, you wouldn't have I don't know those delays. So a few key takeaways um, um, when porting the firmware. So at least when you, when you want to build a, a micro ROS Arduino, you don't have to. Uh, some few things that you to take note. Um, first is calculate time offsets between ROS two clock and the microcontroller's clock. Right, as I mentioned earlier, uh, also remember to handle reconnection with the agent. So currently. Um, the micro ROS library, um, the Arduino doesn't allow, um, actually um, handles reconnection by itself. So you have to explicitly write that in the code, right? And another thing is that um, when I was building the firmware, I initially wanted to build uh, custom messages, which is uh, somehow similar to the old architecture. But then I realized that the IMU messages and the dormitory messages are fully supported in, in, in micro ROS. Uh, Arduino actually can handle publishing it directly from, from the microcontroller. Right. Next thing is that um, always remember to uh, pass the correct number of handles right to when you when you um, initialize the executor uh, in it. So basically, you have to account for the total number of subscribers and time recall. Right? So if you take a look at the repository, this is one of the common mistakes that's being um, posted in the issue section. Lastly, is that a platform IO can also be a good alternative to uh, Arduino IDE, especially when you're um, putting up headless setups on your robots. So here's the um, simulation architecture. So the idea here is that there are two different kinds of launch files, um, which is for the virtual robot and the physical robot. So the idea here is that if you want to switch from virtual robot to gazebo, it's just a matter of changing the launch files, but the rest would be publishing the same uh, messages so that um, whatever you have on the physical robot and on the virtual robot will be exactly the same in terms of the parameters, which makes it easier to fine tune, uh, for example, your slam parameters or your localization parameters. So here's what the parameterized uh, sacro looks like. So the idea here is to abstract the complexity of creating your URDF file and um, just drill down to the basics of the structure uh, of how the robot looks like uh, in terms of uh, what's, uh, how, how long is the weave, uh, how long is the base, uh, how, how wide it is, and as well as some of the build parameters. And from there, the package handles that automatically for you. And with that, uh, this here's one of the example 
um, robot uh, generated from this parameterized cycle. So for autonomous navigation, um, here, here's the packages that are available in, in the repository or, or in the ROS2 package of Lino Robot itself. So for autonomous navigation, it uses Nav2. Um, for SLAM, it uses a SLAM toolbox and, and, and uh, the, the common uh, packages that you will see even for TurtleBox. Right? Even, so it also handles uh, 3D obstacle avoidance, which uses box layers um, that's available by default. And, and so for odometry, it fuses the IMU data and the odometry data using the robot localization package. And here are the topics available um, by which where the robot is subscribed to, to, to receive the twist, the twist messages. And on the right side are the published topics that uh, use, commonly used for uh, making the robot uh, fully autonomous. So here's a demo of the robot uh, creating a map. And here's a autonomous navigation demo. All right, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. So you can find the repository here and uh, feel free to join our uh, Google groups if you want to check out what the community is working on and if you, if you meet, encounter some problems on your build. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Any comment from anyone? I really like the, this project and I'm super glad that the, it uses MicroRoss. And just one thing, uh, I have heard a lot of people uh, asking me uh, how to use MicroRoss in platform EO. And I have seen that it's super easy with, with this config file that you have shown. So maybe Juan Miguel, if, if you could open a pull request, just adding a, a little paragraph in the MicroRoss Arduino repo in order to explain how to integrate the or the MicroRoss Arduino repo in platform EO, it could be super nice. Sure, sure. I, I actually have one repository that, that explains how to port it to platform IO. Maybe I can link it up to Yeah, to the definitely we should, we should link it because it's super useful useful. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Okay. If there's no any other question, we will move on to the second part of this meeting, which is about embedded RTPS, the new experimental middleware for microdose. Let me share my screen. Mm. Okay, so in this section, um, I will make a quick intro of this new micro roles uh, RMW embedded RTPS and the purpose of this work. And then um, Alexander Kapman and Pablo Garrido will present the, the work in more detail. So as, as a quick introduction, I want to show you this is scheme that explains the purpose of this work and why have we gone uh, for this integration? And it is because the trends in the microcontroller capabilities also allow the usage of more complex middleware solutions. Um, and embedded RTPS brings the possibility um, for us of using RTPS communication layer on mid and high ranges microcontrollers with networking capabilities. So in order to bring all sorts of microcontrollers to the ROS2 world through MicroROS, we have created a basic uh, RMW with RTPS for MicroROS. And although it's not complete, it allows the basic functionality of publishing, subscribing, and using the ROS2 services. So, um, MicroROS can be used with two middlewares now. 
Microsoft CDS, which provides already full ROS2, and is targeting low mid range microcontrollers, is industry indoors. And this new in the TPS, targeting higher microcontrollers. And there is still work to be done. Um, but uh, as a result, um, now microros can be compiled uh, with these two uh, in, with these two middlewares. So the developer can easily choose the preferred middleware for, for any application. Um, so well, after this quick introduction, I will let Alexandro Kapman explain his work. I will stop sharing. All right. Um, let me share my screen. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, oh, I have to allow. I'm not using Chrome that often, so hang on a second. Uh, I have to allow it to see my screen. Uh, okay, Google Chrome. Uh, I think I have to rejoin. I'm really sorry for that. I didn't notice that I have to give it permission to for screen sharing. I'm not using Google Hangout that often, so give me a second. All right, I'm back. Uh, hopefully, screen sharing works now for me. Uh, window. OK, uh, here we go. So um, hi, from my side, uh, I'm uh, Alexandru Kampmann. I'm a PhD student at RWTH Aachen University at the Chair for Embedded Software. And uh, I'm one of the creators and current maintainer for Embedded RTPS. And, um, I want to say thank you first for the opportunity to be able to uh, present our work here and also express that I'm uh, excited to see that it is being picked up by Microros. And I want to use this opportunity now to um, actually uh, speak a bit about the um, uh, about the background of Embedded RTPS. So um, everybody's able to see my screen, I guess, right? Uh, nobody has complained yet. Yeah, we can see. Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, let me first lose a few words about the background of embedded RTPS because it motivates a problem that I think other people uh, are facing or have faced in the past. And if I understand correctly, also the first talk um, goes into that direction a bit that we just saw uh, before this one. So uh, embedded RTPS originated in the Unica Agile project. So that's a German project, hence the weird name. So you might also say Unicar Agile, however you wish. Uh, it, this project is one of the largest um, uh, publicly funded research projects on autonomous driving in Germany. And so it's, it's driven by universities only. So there are 16 universities, no uh, OEM, so no BMW, no Daimler, or whoever else is really driven by universities. And the purpose is to build four modular vehicle prototypes, um, such as the one that we see here on the left that is currently unloaded from the truck. And our role in this project is to provide a service-oriented software architecture that runs on all um, essentially computers that are uh, integrated in, in this vehicle. And the so we're not using we're not using ROS one uh, and we're not using ROS two uh, for um, various reasons we can discuss later on. One of them is simply timing because when we started with this project, ROS two was kind of very early. And uh, so we're using DDS at the core of our software architecture, but something else on top that is not really relevant for now uh, for this talk. But um, so as I said, our challenge was to support all, or our ambition was to support all software or all compute platforms that are uh, built into this vehicle. And we can see here on the right side, a very simple um, uh, well figure that shows the uh, essentially the classes of computers we have on, on board. So we have, of course, some full-fledged uh, computers on uh, based on Intel CPUs running Linux. And if we go further down in this figure, then we go uh, step by step towards embedded systems. So here in the middle, we have what we call our brainstem, which is essentially responsible for trajectory control and trajectory planning. 
uh, which is itself a mixture of a, a, a A53 uh, core cores uh, that run Peta Linux and R5, um, R5 cores that run free RTOS. And further down below, we have our dynamic modules. Those are Infineon RX Tricore automotive microcontrollers. There are also safety certified ACOD, actually. And um, so you can see we have a very heterogeneous, uh, uh, well, um, set of computers in our vehicle. And uh, so we face the challenge of integrating, especially the microcontrollers in our uh, architecture, in our software architecture. And one of the typical ways to go about this is what I would call here a bridge architecture where you have your microcontroller um, that is hooked up to a one of the more powerful platforms, uh, for example, using a serial port and you use your, for example, custom protocol or raw serial or XRCE DDS to integrate a microcontroller into the communication network to a uh, essentially integrating platform. And the issue with this approach for us in our project was basically safety and uh, we wanted to make a safety argument or we wanted to be able to make a safety argument for the microcontroller to be an independent uh, system uh, in within the vehicle within the vehicle uh, which is not possible if we use such a bridge architecture because the survival of the microcontroller depends on the survival of the of the integrating platform and there are also potential performance hits that come on top, but that was not the, the main uh, motivation. So we had a look around and we just noticed that there's only, well, essentially, may, maybe we missed something, but we saw that there's essentially RTI providing a commercial uh, embedded implementation for um, RTPS. So we went ahead and, and tried to make our own, which uh, was, um, well, I would like to say it's successful. Uh, in, in terms that we succeeded to make an implementation that runs on microcontrollers, which is now embedded RTPS. So embedded RTPS allows to run um, the uh, protocol on microcontrollers uh, without having to rely on any integrating component uh, in such an architecture. So this for us, for the purpose of our project was a step towards more modularity and it was it allowed us to, to treat the microcontroller as independent system uh, and and um, which which helped with our safety arguments. Um, now I want to say also very clearly this I'm not wanna I don't want to speak bad necessarily about XRCE at all. I think that definitely has its uh, uh, its uh, its purpose and uh, its applications for sure, especially for lower powered controllers. For more powerful controllers that um, have Ethernet or Wi-Fi, uh, embedded RTPS can be used to uh, run uh, the full stack on the controller now. Now, um, just on a few next slides, just a few more words about uh, embedded RTPS in general and its architecture. So we use free artists and lightweight IP APIs. So um, for those who don't know, free artists is an embedded operating system, very lightweight one. And lightweight IP is a networking stack um, also for microcontrollers. And those two are available for a lot of microcontrollers. Uh, that's why uh, we, we went out uh, and started out with those. But um, that is um, not necessarily su tied, uh, uh, super tightly to free RTOS. So because the APIs we use are very basic ones that are also available in other operating systems. So we have internally also a port for ChibiOS, for example. Uh, as mentioned before, embedded RTPS is implemented using C++. And, uh, but we're, we're not making any use of fancy runtime, runtime type inference or any uh, expensive uh, SDR containers. Um, mainly the whole, the, the, the complete memory of a better RTPS is statically allocated. And we, we chose C++ because we didn't, we first wanted to see uh, how it, uh, it's possible, whether it's possible to, to uh, implement this protocol for a microcontroller using C++. And second, we wanted to avoid having void pointers on all kinds of ends in, in the code base. Um, now, uh, currently um, there are three repositories on GitHub. Uh, one is the uh, core embedded RTPS repository, and there is one for the port to the STM32, but we uh, internally have also ported it for the Infineon Aurex tri-core control as well as for the Xilinx Ultrascale um, R5 core. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot make those two available for licensing reasons. I think we will get into trouble if we would publish, especially Infineon code on GitHub. Um, but um, yeah, so those of you who are familiar with uh, with RTPS and DDS know that there's a there's a, a whole gazillion uh, ton of 
uh, quality of service uh, policies that allow to configure the communication. For us, the only two that really were um, necessary for now were best effort and reliable endpoints. So we support those uh, QoS policies. Um, and we also implemented the discovery protocol, the SPDP and the SCDP protocols, and we support also multicast communication. And the third repository is a repository that uh, is, um, contains a Docker container for running embedded RTPS on Linux for development purposes. And uh, on the right side here, we see a um, very well simplified uh, de uh, depiction of the architecture of embedded RTPS. So, Essentially, the user up here in interacts with embedded RTPS through the domain object, which allows to create readers and writers for topics. And uh, this uh, part of the system also manages the built-in endpoints that are used for discovery, as well as uh, handling participant management for, uh, well, keeping track of remote particip participants and their endpoint, essentially. Uh, we have decided to decouple uh, embedded RTPS from free artists and Lightwood IP using a thread pool. So uh, any message that is coming in through Lightwood IP is handed off to a, a, a thread that we own and then uh, further processed through our stack and handed to the user. So the alternative would be to do everything in the context of, of the Lightwood IP threads, but uh, the user can potentially stall that thread for quite a long time, which might lead to, to problems in the networking stack. That's why we I decided to to use this uh, architecture, and uh, the other the same goes for for essentially going down towards uh, Lightwood IP from the user space. And there's there's a lot of things that can be configured about embedded RTPS that influence uh, memory consumption. So, uh, for example, the number of endpoints have to be already uh, decided at compile time. Um, okay, so now I've compiled on the next few slides some evaluation uh, results that we conducted over the years. So. Uh, we started development in uh, in the second half of 2018. So some of these numbers are maybe a bit old by now. Um, so in this first setup, we measure round trip times um, between two Infineon Aurix controllers. Those are, as I mentioned before, ACLD automotive controllers running at 180 megahertz. And we measure round trip times. So one of the participants sends a package to the other and the other responds as quickly as possible. And we measure the time it takes for the packet to go back and forth. And we can see here, we've done this experiment for various uh, packet sizes. And for each package, uh, packet size, we, we ran 10,000 uh, iterations of this experiment. And we uh, obtained some statistics about latency. And um, the one that I only usually pay attention to is the maximum time. That's actually the only thing that matters for, uh, well, real time or deterministic and, and uh, uh, systems, especially related to safety. So. Um, we can see here for a package size, for example, of 256 bytes, we have runtime times of roughly 1.4 milliseconds. So you could approximate that it takes 0 .0 0.7 milliseconds for one direction and another 0 0.7 in the other direction. Um, second experiment, again, round trip times, this time running embedded RTPS on an STM32 controller, which is speaking to an Intel NUC i5, which runs a Cosima fast RTPS. As I said, these evaluations are uh, a bit old. So uh, back then it used to be still called fast RTPS, I think in version 1.8. And here we see again, same uh, type of experiment. Again, Rob round trip times reported. Again, an example at 256 bytes, we see roughly 2.4 milliseconds round trip times. Um, and uh, you have to judge yourself whether those numbers are sufficiently good for your application. Uh, for us, it, uh, it's, it's, it's sufficient. Um, um, next experiment is, uh, again, the more recent one, actually, this is only one or two months old. It's, um, so here we're running a better RTPS on an ARM R5, um, uh, on, on a Xilinx ultra scale board, which speaks to a Ubuntu machine. I think it's again, an, it was an Intel NUC i5, uh, which runs fast DBS in the latest version back then. I think it was 2.2 or 2.3. So fairly new version of fast DBS. And here we, we, we've done only one experiment at 512 bytes and 10,000 iterations. And we see here again latencies um, and the maximum time for, for this package size for the message to go back and forth between those two participants is 0 0.65 millisecond, um, which is quite a lot faster than what we've seen here before. And But it's also hard to compare these two experiments because the ARM5 has a lot, I think, a lot more power than the, than the, than the STM32. 
and the fat CDS was a newer version, but just for you to, to have an impression of the performance. Um, last uh, experiment I want to present is regarded, uh, is regarding multicast communication. So in this setup, we have five uh, devices that talk with each other. We measure again around two times. So this time uh, we have one publisher that sends a message to uh, four uh, remote endpoints. And uh, we measure the time it takes for all four uh, participants to respond to that message. And here we have embedded articles running again on the R5, but we also have it running on two Intel-based system and one Raspberry Pi. As, and uh, there's also one uh, FastCDS instance in the mix, just to see that whether we're compatible with, uh, with that or not. And here we do 20 rounds and 100 samples within each round at uh, 256 bytes packet size. And uh, here we see the results, uh, quite big tables. Uh, on the left side, so this table shows the performance for multicast communication, and the right table shows the performance for unicast communication. To be honest, there's not a big difference in the maximum times. Uh, uh, so we still have to maybe to investigate, see whether something is, uh, uh, what, what the reason for this might be. But um, it's, nevertheless, I wanted to show you these numbers. Um, so the maximum time for one, uh, for the publisher to send the message and all four to respond to that message is 10 milliseconds uh, on average. So then the maximum value is on average for the, those 20 rounds around 10 milliseconds. Um, and for Unicast, very similar numbers. So uh, we have to, as I said, the, 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 we didn't see a, a big improvement between Multicast and Unicast. But, and I believe that's probably because of the small packet size that we are, we are using here. All right, so uh, that was my last slide for experiments. So this is my final slide. I want to say again, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, you can find embedded RTPS on GitHub uh, under MIT license. And we, the next thing that we will add is ownership, quality of service, policy, and uh, of course, pull requests are welcome. I'm sure there are a lot of things to be uh, improved and to be uh, uh, well implemented and and uh, so on. So I'm. I would be happy to, if, if people contribute to this project. And if you wish to contact me directly, here's again my, my email address. All right, so thank you so much. That was all uh, that I wanted to share with you. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, doesn't seem like so. <laughs> Uh, if I may, I got a couple of questions. Yes, please. Okay. I, uh, thanks for the talk. I am, I am with uh, Sony Tomoya. Yeah. My name is Tomoya. So the quick question: that, Does it support NatX? Uh, I think the Micro Ross uh, experimental yeah. support has NatX, right, Pablo? I think yeah. no, it does not. Yeah. Not not really because we we are targeting in Micros the, the the system that uses free artos and, and like with IP, but Natex has its own POSIX network layer, I think. Okay. So regarding the operating system, as I mentioned before, we're only using some very well, I want to say basic API calls. So it's it, we, we okay. it was easy to replace it for ChibiOS, for example. We've done it internally where we haven't replaced. Well, actually, we did replace the networking layer in the Docker container because we are running, uh, we're essentially simulating the uh, lightweight IP uh, communication on, on in, in the context of the Docker container. So I think the, the API calls are only a few, so it should be possible to also port to other operating systems. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. I mean, uh, so the basic idea that based on this activity is to bring the, the interoperability for RTPS uh, without having any agent, right? That's so right. That, yeah. So that we can have the more isolation for each node. Yes. So okay, that makes I, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So in the context of my, probably Pablo will say more to to this. So for us, it was the as I mentioned initially was the uh, we want we we wanted to control to be a first class participant in the network and not depend on another node to integrate it. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and, and I have one question. You have told uh, just now that in the in the Docker version of embedded RTPS, you have re rewrote the the layer in order to use POSIX network interfaces and and, and all the POSIX threading system. And that's uh, no, that that's that's true. 
Yes. So, I mean, you can run the unit tests on, on Linux. So that's running on, uh, uh, you can run, as I said, as you've seen on the multicast experiments, we had embedded articles running on a Raspberry Pi that was on Linux. So we didn't use, uh, we, there was no free artist. It was running on Ubuntu essentially on, 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 on so it's possible. Yes. Okay. I don't know exactly. I don't, so I don't have the exact details in mind, but there's a repository uh, embedded RTPS on Linux that's also linked from our main repository and you can see how it's done there. So we're creating a tap interface and hook up like with IP to that and then it's possible to to use okay. it also on Linux. I will check that, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question uh, regarding using ROS2 on top of uh, embedded RTPS directly on the microcontroller, so RCI CPP. Please. We had some some email conversation yes. before, so I I was just thinking, you know, when when you already have uh, embedded RTPS, which is uh, standalone, and you have discovery and you have quality of service of best effort and reliable, um, what would be the effort, or where are the let's say pain points from your point of view to put just the RCI CPP layer on top? Um. I think that has it's already been done. And so in an effort um, that I'm happy to learn. MROS. Exactly. I think that the, isn't that the approach that's been taken in MROS? So the, that, that's essentially what they did, right? There is a, yeah. a project for this on the way already. So yeah. they seem to, so they had also a, um, um, a lightning talk. So essentially it seems to be, they, they've got something working. As, I, I cannot speak to to the quality or the the issues or pain points they had, but um, obviously it's doable to some extent. Yes, I'm not sure what the limitations there are. Okay, but let's say in your framework, it would be no no benefit to use ROS2 instead of uh, uh, your framework that you are using at the moment. Uh, well. For, no, because it, we we have a different uh, well system view essentially. So we have uh, so the system integration in our layer that is running on top of RTPS is not automatic. Uh, so we don't match topics. Just uh, uh, so we use RTPS underneath, but we have a layer that controls who speaks to what uh, service and who is running at what point in time. Because in in Unikagi we have a, a few very different operation modes. So we have a remote operation mode where you can, where somebody connects from well, essentially over the internet onto the vehicles and is able to remotely control it. We have automated driving, we have maintenance modes and and uh, uh, all of them require a, well, a system level control of who is, what service is running right now, who is it talking to. And so that's, we have a different approach to, to ROS2 essentially than in that, in that regard. So that's, so, so you're, you're addressing this execution mechanism, so to say, it's a layer that basically controls which callback is running when, and uh, so it's a, yeah, yeah that yeah. kind and, of... And what component speaks to which other component over the network. And uh, yes. so we decouple the system integration information from individual components. And we have one component that we call the orchestrator, which is a state machine that depending on the situation is, uh, activating a different set of services and uh, configuring them in another in a different uh, in a way so but i i'm happy to uh, discuss this in more detail if you wish and uh, also bilateral yeah. calls and yeah okay yeah thanks you're welcome regarding this qu question uh, on ros2 that goes back to, to pablo but i mean given that we have an rw adapter for embedded rtps there is no reason why it should not be usable directly with ros2 or or are there any limitations in the adapter? I think Pablo has to. So he yeah. has another presentation, right, uh, in, in a bit. So maybe he can address these questions. Yeah. Um, basically, the, the only thing that I have not been able to, to implement in directly in the RMW for embed RTPS is, is the graph management. Because okay. I, I'm not sure if you have a uh, transient local QoSs, right? Uh, I don't think so. No, uh, we, yeah. the, so we, regarding that aspect, we only have one uh, as, uh, QoS implemented, but it's extendable, I guess. If some, as yeah, I said, yeah. we, we didn't uh, target the ROS2, so uh, if, yeah, we never mind what exact feature is missing, but it doesn't seem to be a big one. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, so maybe I can just comment very quickly. 
what we have done, we have been doing in here. Uh, we have just adapted this this software to to Micros, just creating a an error W called MLRPPS, and I I I I I, I was saying. Uh, this is an experimental package that only implements a uh, publication subscription uh, and services server and services client. That's all. We don't have graph and we don't have introspection. We don't have other other kind of thing that that an R and W can use. And we just have integrated this uh, couple of packages: the the new R and W and the the Alexandru uh, software in some of our uh, build systems we have choose the the the, th the the ones that i think that are more more interesting for example the, the esp idf component because um esp32 from expressive uses by default uh, free actors and like with ip so we have integrated uh, these couple of repositories here and you can just select which one of of them you want to use we also have uh, integrated this in the uh, QMX uh, utils. Uh, this repo targets both the QMX and the Cube IDE. So uh, with this uh, component, you have instructions to uh, to use both MicroXRDS and Embedded RTPS um, with Micros in the in almost all the the ST microelectronics. MCUs that have enough power and and, and of course networking. Uh, okay, and I also you have instructions here, and I also wanted to show you a super quick demo of this working on the ESP32 because I think that we don't have enough time. So here I have the the, the ESP ID component with the, the examples examples that you might know the, the RCLC example where you create a publisher subscribers etc and here we have for example a publisher and a subscriber running on top of an RCLC uh, real-time executor with the callbacks and, and all the things that we have been using in, in micros uh, for for all the time and uh, we just wanted I'm going to capture here and I just wanted to show that if you go to the example folder and run a menu config, you will be able to change here in macro setting the middleware that you want to use. In this case, I have selected the embedded RTPS one with the PubSub example. I'm going to connect the, the chip and just this is already built because it, it takes a, a little bit to build, but it's already built, so I'm going to build flash and monitor. Uh, now it's build, linking, and flashing. And once it is flash, uh, we will have the, the console output of the of the microcontroller. Okay. Here we have that we are connected to the Eprosima Wi-Fi and we are sending things to, to RTPS. This is the MCU uh, IP and here just open a uh, Rostu environment in a Docker, for example. Rostu topic list P. I hope that this works. And here we have our in32 publisher and subscriber. If we do a Rostu topic echo of the in32 publisher for example we can see that we have the data that the mcu is sending and on the other side there's a uh, rose two topic pub of in queue subscriber uh, std messages in queue and for example let's send a data both we are publishing and the MTU is residing here the data and of course all of this is happening in, in, in obviously RTPS so we are super happy that now we are we are able to send um, we use the RTPS uh, white protocol on behind micros and see these kind of super interesting demos that does not have a
So we call the community in order to, to, to help us with the RNW because there is a lot of things that should be implemented. Um, and that's all. If you have any questions. I have a question. So um, did you um, happen to run any benchmarks on timing? So I've, I've presented a few numbers that we ran just for the RTPS layer, but I'm curious to see if, if uh, you've done some yourselves. No, we don't have any any benchmarking because we have had no time for, for this, just for doing the port and integrating this in the in the in the build systems. But we don't we haven't had time for, for benchmarking. I see, okay. And did you so did you have to change a lot of things on embedded RTPS itself? No, just the, the main thing was the this uh, version of micro CDR that you have. Yeah. We, are, <laughs> we are using the, the official micro CDR and a couple of changes in the in the API usage in the okay. RTPS. And so, I guess that there is a thing in the in the lightweight IP implementation in, in the IDF. I have a, a couple of defines there because mm -hmm. in the transport thing, there are a difference between the normal lightweight IP and the IDF lightweight IP, but minor things. Okay. So I would be, I mean, I would be super happy if you uh, would maybe consider uh, sending a pull request for the changes you made so we can keep track on, so we're not diverging uh, in, in, in terms of the development. Yeah, because we're also looking at it in, in, so we have uh, we work on it internally it's not that publicly visible on github because we have internal folks working on on for example the um ownership stuff and uh so we we're, we're not adding like every week a new feature because but we, we still keep uh well there's still work going on so it would be great if that would okay. not diverge okay perfect i will Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. We have covered the agenda. Uh, we're going to reach the top of the hour. So there's no any further topic added in the miscellaneous section. So we can wrap up. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending, especially the speakers. And also thank you, thank the attendees um, who provided insights. And generate discussion. Um, the recording of this meeting will be online soon and also it will be added to the meeting notes document. So thank you very much everyone and see you next month with more projects and features. Thank you.